Right, I think we can get started. Welcome everybody to this um, event. Um, we thought we should have a, at least a little celebration of a hundred years of the BBC because um, uh, after all, the BBC has had quite an important role in post-war Germany and in um, public radio and television in, in Germany. And um, strangely, this role has quite a lot to do with a man about whom very much more shortly, Hugh Green, who happens uh, to be a cousin of mine, or he was. He was a first cousin of my mother's. So if you see the name Green, um, attached to other people in the audience. This has a reason, but I did let some members of the family know that we were having this event and um, special welcome to them from here. Um, yes, we are very pleased to have Emily Oliver with us tonight um, to talk to us. She's been doing a lot of work to do with uh, the BBC and Germany. She's been on TV, she was speaking at a conference here in Berlin only about two weeks ago, and we couldn't have found anybody uh, better to talk to us about um, the BBC for Germany. Just before we get started, a couple of household remarks. Um, this session is being recorded, and incidentally, it will then um, be accessible via YouTube. Um, and after the talk, if you uh, would like to join the discussion, please put your questions or comments in the chat and then we can pick them sort of more or less by subject matter. Um, and with that, over to our guest, Emily um, Oliver, who um, is a historian and has done, as I was saying, quite a lot of work on um, BBC and um, uh, German and English relations in general. Um, I should add that she speaks absolutely flawless uh, German, but um, according to our usual custom, we are, of course, having this event in English. You saw the particulars about her career in the invitation, so I didn't repeat any of that. And with that, I'll turn it over to Emily, so the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rupert. Oh, sorry, just one, one remark before we get started. You're very welcome to keep cameras on, but we would ask you to mute your microphones so, so we don't have disturbing noises while we listen to Emily. Sorry. No, that's absolutely fine. Thank you. Uh, my screen share has just disappeared. Just a second. I'll get back to it. There we are. Okay. Um, yes, well, thank you, Rupert, for that very kind introduction. Um, as uh, Rupert mentioned, I am, uh, I've been working on the BBC German service for several years, and uh, in between bouts of teaching teenagers German grammar, I am still writing a history of the BBC German service. Um, and uh, so if there is anyone in the audience uh, who remembers listening to the BBC German service or indeed knows people who were on the staff or was on the staff themselves, I am always delighted to hear from anyone uh, who has memories of the BBC German service. So if that is you, do get in touch. My details are on screen at the moment. Um, so as Rupert mentioned, the BBC was hugely influential for rebuilding German broadcasting after the Second World War. And so this talk is really in two parts. Uh, the first half focuses on the war itself and the second part on the immediate post-war period when Germany was under allied occupation and it follows Hugh Green's journey through that. I am here to make myself superfluous. This was Hugh Carlton Green's announcement to employees of Nordwest Deutscher Rundfunk, NWDR, when he addressed them in the station's concert hall in Hamburg in 1946. Having successfully run the BBC German service during the war, 
Green had been appointed chief controller for broadcasting for the British zone of occupied Germany. And as such, he was in charge of rebuilding radio in North Germany, which had been devastated spiritually by the Nazis and materially by Allied bombing raids. By the end of 1948, NVDR was in German hands and Green left Germany considering his job done. He would go on to become the BBC's director general in the 1960s. In order to understand how he came to establish an entirely new successful broadcaster for Northwest Germany, whose successor organizations still exist today, it's necessary to look at the things Green had learned at the BBC German service during the war. His success in broadcasting, I think, can be attributed chiefly to three things. Green's willingness to shield his staff from outside interference, his capacity for spotting and ignoring nonsense, and his ability to gauge what would convince listeners that a radio station was, in some sense, on their side. The BBC German service was founded somewhat hastily during the Munich crisis in 1938. And initially it drew at random on German speaking journalists in London. For instance, its very first broadcast on the 27th of September, 1938, Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain's live speech on his Munich talks with Hitler was a bit of a disaster. BBC producers only had a few hours notice that Chamberlain wanted his speech broadcast simultaneously in German, which left them madly telephoning all over London to find competent translators and presenters. They finally reached Robert Lukas, a Jewish Austrian emigre working as the London correspondent for a Viennese newspaper, who found himself translating the speech as it was coming through line by line without access to a secretary or even a typewriter. The speaker tasked with delivering Chamberlain's speech in German had even less broadcasting experience than Lukas. Walter Goetz was a German-born cartoonist for the Daily Express who had been thrust into a BBC studio at very short notice and had to wait desperately at the microphone for the next translated sentence to be fed through so he could read it out live on air. And if you ever get to listen to that first broadcast, you can hear the painful pauses in between lines. So after this inauspicious start, the German service continued its ad hoc broadcasting at the Foreign Office's request for a while, with news bulletins being written by BBC overseas service staff and then translated into German in-house. It was only in April 1939, with war very much looming on the horizon, that the German service became a department in its own right. It looked as though the BBC German service was going to struggle on in its slightly shambolic fashion, when in October 1940, at the age of only 29, Hugh Carlton Green, incidentally novelist Graham Green's little brother, was placed in charge. He had no radio or managerial experience, but having previously worked as the Daily Telegraph's Berlin correspondent, he spoke excellent German, and he had in fact covered the Anschluss and uh, significant events for the Daily Telegraph. Green restructured the German service, adding features, satire, and other formats to its somewhat limited output, but retaining the focus on news and commentary. Through chairing daily program meetings, he gradually turned a heterogeneous group of British, German, Austrian writers, journalists, academics, politicians, directors, and actors into an efficient broadcasting team. One of Green's first innovations was to change the German service's introductory announcement from its neutral, here is der Londoner Rundfunk, this is Radio London, to the clarion call, here is England, here is England, here is England, thus emphasizing the service's identity as a British station rather than a mouthpiece for German speaking emigres. Whilst emphatically insisting on the German service's British identity, Green also aimed to improve the style and quality of its German language broadcasts. Along with the head of the French service, Darcy Gilly, 
Green reversed the practice of news items being written in English at the central news desk and subsequently translated. News was now written in the target language to make the style more accessible and its effect more immediate. Green made further stylistic changes to overcome the impact of Nazi broadcast jamming. So this is the practice of broadcasting interference noise on the same wavelength. Following a trip to Stockholm in August 1942, he concluded that the interference noise had a tiring effect on listeners. And he therefore insisted on clear, slower delivery, reducing the number of words per minute. He sought out presenters with deep resonant voices rather than high pitched voices. And news bulletins were read by two announcers presenting alternate items. And there were also no more elaborate features using complicated sound effects. Moreover, Green claimed that he and his staff invented a new German style, abolishing long complicated sentences and favoring precision and clarity over beauty of expression. Now, initially, the more literary minded German staff members uh, did not look upon these innovations favorably, but with the help of his head of the translation services, Karl Brinitzer, Green prevailed and his style of German was used throughout the war. While war raged around him, Green faced another enemy much closer to home, his immediate boss, Noel Newsom. As the BBC's director of European broadcasts, Newsom had the unenviable task of ensuring that all the many different language services did as they were told. This was extremely difficult given the fast pace of daily news in wartime, as well as the very independent minded men running the individual services. In his official history of the BBC, Asa Briggs praises Newsom for successfully deploying the weapon of responsible journalism and the instruments of the clever advertiser. Whereas Robert Lucas of the German service described Newsom as blissfully ignorant of Europe, to which Green added, yes, but also completely ignorant of the basic tenets of propaganda. Green summarized his relationship with his superior as follows. I couldn't stand Noel Newsom and Noel Newsom couldn't stand me. Newsom used to issue a daily directive and they were really quite fantastically silly. He was very energetic, but extremely ignorant. And as far as Darcy Gilly and I were concerned, we regarded it as one of our contributions to the war effort to see that no traces of Newsom's directives were ever seen. In order to avoid too much exposure to Newsom's views, Green usually sent his deputy, Maurice Leite, um, a senior member of the German service uh, to meetings with Noel Newsom. If he was forced to attend himself, he would sit there cold and silent with a look of contempt on his face. Uh, you can see his deputy, Maurice Leite, on the far right here. Given this acrimonious atmosphere, it is astonishing that any news made it to Germany via the BBC at all, but Hugh Green's efforts to fend off Newsom's daily directives seem to have been largely successful. The main way in which the German service attracted listeners was its claim to be the voice of truth, which entailed reporting British military setbacks as well as victories. The key element at the heart of all programming was accurate and up-to-date news acting as the magnet which attracted the audience and encouraged them to continue listening. Because of course, um, listening to the BBC German service within Nazi Germany was a huge risk and uh, there were severe punishments for that. Um, so the news was the magnet for the audience. All other formats served as bait for the news, including in the later war years, messages from German prisoners of war from England. In order to persuade its German audience to take the considerable risk of listening to enemy broadcasts, the BBC German service judiciously differentiated between warmongering Nazis and supposedly peaceful, ordinary Germans. In doing so, the service consistently aimed to break down the will to fight of the German people by convincing them that defeat is certain, but the defeat at the hands of the allies would not have intolerable consequences for the ordinary citizen. In short, to provide a judicious blend of despair and hope propaganda. 
This strategy clearly paid off as more and more people listened to the German service during the later war years. For the first year after the war, the German service received over 2,000 letters a month detailing just how important its broadcasts had been to listeners during the darkest days of Nazi rule. To some people, this really was a lifeline out of Nazi Germany. The German service continued to broadcast after the war, and by August 1946, it had an estimated 2 million listeners in Germany, of which roughly half lived in the British zone of occupation. So much for the British side of things. On the ground in Germany, the Reichstation Hamburg was captured by the British army on the 4th of May, 1945. Barely 24 hours after its last German broadcast, listeners heard the announcement, this is Radio Hamburg, a station of the Allied military government, followed by the British national anthem. With the help of British radio engineers and some local staff, Radio Hamburg gradually resumed transmissions, initially relaying programs from the BBC German service and from Radio Luxembourg. By the summer of 1945, it had become clear that no unified allied broadcasting strategy would be achieved and that each occupying power would pursue its own policy for its respective zone. Whereas the Americans established stations for individual lender within their zones, as you can see there, Bayerischer Rundfunk, uh, Bavarian Radio, or Hessischer Rundfunk uh, for Hessen, the British naturally turned to the BBC as their model. They envisaged one central, independent public broadcasting service for their zone. They therefore broadened Radio Hamburg's reach to include what would later become Lower Saxony, Schleswig-Holstein, and North Rhine-Westphalia. The broadcaster, which now also operated studios in Cologne, Hanover, and Berlin, was accordingly renamed Nordwestdeutscher Rundfunk. However, NVDR and the BBC German service were now in danger of stepping on each other's toes. In November 1945, it was agreed that NVDR should fulfill the function of providing for the British zone of Germany a home service, while the BBC would provide for Germany as a whole a London service speaking with the voice of Britain. A subsequent policy document stated unambiguously that the re-education of the German people is the direct concern of the BBC German service. This document is interesting as it essentially exempts NVDR from contributing to the British re-education efforts. To retain its audience and to build effectively a new tradition in German broadcasting, NVDR must not be too obviously concerned with the re-education of the audience or even with the raising of its cultural standards. Entertainment will not be too obviously edifying and information not too obviously instructional. Excessive attention by NVDR to the political and historical re-education of Germans will destroy its credibility. And it follows that the world and British views of current and past events should be conveyed to the German public by other means, other means being the BBC German service. We can detect here, I think, an anxiety that NVDR should not seem too British Although it was being run by the British, it should masquerade as a German station, whereas overt British propaganda and the projection of Britain should be undertaken by the BBC German service. This constitutes an admission on the part of British policymakers that re-education was not only unpopular with Germans, but that it would actively hinder NVDR in gaining and retaining listeners. The division of labor between NVDR as a German home service and the BBC German service as the voice of Britain had important consequences for programming. While NVDR's output ranged from news to light entertainment programs specifically tailored to its local and regional audiences, the BBC German service turned, well, shall we say turgid at this point, it was effectively turned into a didactic public relations agency for the United Kingdom, and it would henceforth struggle to attract listeners. Um, and here are some of the examples of the things it was turning out. So in addition to a daily report on the Nuremberg trials, 
The BBC introduced features detailing Hitler's rise to power, a long series called How Democracy Works, and talks explaining British rule in different parts of the empire. In July 1945 alone, it broadcast six talks on the work of military government, covering industry, food, transport, communications, justice, education, and public health. Although these items contained important information for German listeners, several of the predictions they made turned out to be inaccurate. For instance, uh, there was an assurance that the food situation in 1946 to 47 will be better than it is at present. When food provision in fact worsened considerably during the winter of 46 to 47, the BBC sounded out of touch and somewhat condescending to German listeners suffering shortages under British occupation. David Welsh summarizes that the result of the December 1945 decisions was to create a two-tier radio service in which the BBC German service began to suffer in comparison with NVDR. Increasingly, the BBC became associated with pedagogic re-education and guilt mobilization, whereas NVDR was perceived by many Germans as the authentic voice of the vanquished under occupation. So what was NVDR doing differently? Well, one of the main differences is that by this point, um, Hugh Green had moved from the BBC German service to NVDR. He arrived in Hamburg in October 1946, and it seems that the winter of 46 to 47 played a pivotal role in determining the station's popularity with Germans. The second winter following Germany's unconditional surrender was the coldest of the 20th century. Temperatures dropped to minus 20 degrees, major waterways froze over, and the resulting food and fuel shortages led to 60,000 deaths from hypothermia and malnourishment. 10 months into the occupation, the allies were still struggling to feed the population of their respective zones and rations kept decreasing further. For the British zone, they lay somewhere between 1,050 and 1,500 calories. Looking back on his first winter in Hamburg, Green said, I think it was very important, a very important thing for the morale and unity of the whole staff, German and English, at that appalling time, that though we English had better food and drink, we too froze in our quarters and were known to do so. There was some heating in the Hamburg Broadcasting House, and many people spent their nights there on sofas, on chairs, or on the floor. This sense of solidarity was not limited to staff, but also extended to listeners. NVDR started announcing the arrival times of coal trains and the points in their journeys at which they would be going at their slowest, allowing people to jump aboard and steal coal for personal use. Green recalls the style of broadcast was very similar to wartime communiques about enemy air raids. A coal train is standing at this moment in a siding at Buchholz in der Heide. Another will pass the Hamburg Damtor station in about an hour and so on. I dare say there are still some hamburgers who remember those revealing communiques with gratitude. When Hamburg officials complained about these broadcasts and their effect on the local population, Green maintained that this was a purely German matter and therefore nothing to do with him. Another clash between NVDR and local officials became known as the Great Pete Scandal. When NVDR employees heard that there was a great reserve of peat in one of Hamburg's suburbs, they reported this on the air, since peat constituted valuable heating material. The Hamburg Senate's immediate reaction was to announce that this was, this was unburnable wet peat. NVDR decided to investigate these claims, as Green recalls. One of our reporters spent a night with the watchman at the peat dump and found that his little hut, warmed with the unburnable peat, was the most comfortable place in Hamburg. His report the next day brought Hamburg politicians screaming with rage to my office with demands for apologies and the dismissal of all concerned. Naturally, they got nothing. The instinct to shield his German staff from outside attacks was characteristic of Green's leadership style at this time. Peter von Zahn, one of NVDR's earliest staff members, remarked that Green never interfered with the content of individual programs. He says, the only thing that I remember worked the other way round 
when he went on the air defending things that we had done against party pressure. Green reacted similarly to protests from other occupying forces. In November 1946, Fonsan wrote a commentary called How to Deal with Conquerors, the German title is Umgang mit Wiegern, in which he gently made fun of the occupiers by characterizing them as a sensitive species. No sudden movements, no unexpected shouting. Soft noises have a calming effect. The conqueror will only lose his fear of us when he knows that he needn't fear anything unexpected from us. This and other broadcasts attracted criticism from the Americans. Apart from objectionable comments about the allied occupation forces, this kind of programming was seen as a cheap way of gaining German listeners. In early 1947, Klaus Werner Karol, then the head of spoken word at the US controlled station Radio Bremen claimed that, for a while now, NVDR has been exploiting an almost pathological tolerance on the part of its controlling officers to present the German listener precisely with the kind of thing Radio Bremen is at pains to prevent. Through the confidence trick of allegedly frank words, more and more listeners are drifting over to NVDR. Radio Bremen is sticking to its political pedagogical attitude and losing its listeners. The relative freedom granted to commentators at NVDR was perceived as an unfair advantage and to some extent a dishonest way of attracting listeners. And if we go back to that map, we can see why Radio Bremen would have felt this disparity so keenly because it was a tiny little island right in the middle of NVDR's broadcasting area. It was precisely this liberal working atmosphere which proved attractive to a number of talented young journalists who would shape German media for decades to come. In order to foster new talent, NVDR opened its own broadcasting school in January 1947, modeled on the BBC's training school. For his part, Hugh Green spent the last year of his tenure in Germany drawing up a constitution to secure NVDR's future. And it is here that the BBC's function as a model comes through most clearly. British officials in charge of broadcasting agreed that NVDR should be an institution of public law, independent of the government, centralized and financed by a license fee. Moreover, it should have a director general at its head, supervised by a board of governors. This would enable NVDR to avoid undue pressure from the state and from political parties. However, there was a structural flaw in using the BBC as a model, since in Britain, the board of governors is appointed by the monarch. Green needed to find a substitute for this function, which stood above party politics. He decided on the creation of a body known as the Hauptausschuss, the members of which would be there by virtue of holding certain offices. So that meant the minister presidents of the three lender in the British zone, the mayor of Hamburg, the rector of Göttingen University, the president of the Zonal Trades Union Council, and the presidents of the most important women's youth and cultural organization in the zone. The problem with this substitution, however, was that all of these people had gained their position to some extent through representing political parties. So this problem wasn't completely resolved ever. Nevertheless, after months of green driving all over the British zone for discussions with various interested groups and representatives and duly amending the constitution every time, the NVDR charter finally came into force on the 1st of January, 1948 and Adolf Grimme became the first German director general. Until November that year, military government still had the power to censor content and approve appointments, but this too ceased on the 15th of November, 1948. NVDR was now officially in German hands. Hugh Green left for England four days later, remarking, I do not believe in backseat driving. In the space of two years, he had created a new German broadcasting institution by giving German staff a free reign and defending them against external criticism, both from German politicians and from other occupying powers. His work was no doubt helped immensely by the British decision in 1945 to exempt NVDR 
from the duty of re-educating Germans. Drawing on his experience at the BBC German service of establishing a loyal listenership through telling the truth, Green enabled NVDR to attract listeners by reporting on issues which reflected negatively on the British and by allowing German staff to freely express their views of the occupiers. Moreover, he continued the successful technique of using certain program items as bait. The reports on coal trains and the NVDR's inclusion of a tracing service are examples of this. Finally, Green established a legal basis for NVDR's future. Although far from perfect, this document, along with his other achievements, indicated that by the time Green left Germany, he had in many ways succeeded in making himself superfluous. Oops. Well, thank you very, very much, Emily. This was, um, of course, extraordinarily interesting. And it was also extremely timely because as, of course, our uh, German friends in the audience know, we are having quite a discussion, public discussion at the moment um, on our public um, radio and TV stations, um, and some of it, of course, is about interference from politics and um, other measures. So to look at what happened at the beginning and how determined Hugh Green was to make um, broadcasting independent from politics and government and, and uh, bureaucracy is, of course, quite a good thing to remember. Now, time is... Um, Right, for questions, for comments, please put them in the chat and we'll try and um, accommodate as many um, as we can. Who would like to ask a question or comment? Perhaps I'll start with one. Um, and we talked about it the other day when we met. Um, Hugh Green was quite adamant about protecting um, journalists from sort of direct um, sort of uh, influence and, and harassment uh, from uh, outs outsiders and superiors and so on. Perhaps you could just elaborate a tiny bit on that one. Uh, yes, well, that seems to be a recurring theme in what staff say about Hugh Green, um, that he, well, I think there's two sides to this. The, the one is the, the sort of um, positive feature of protecting your own staff against outside interference and, and giving them the space to um, make uh, interesting programs and, and to a certain extent giving their creativity, free reign. So there's, there's a lot of comments on that, that, that staff could sort of do their own thing um, under his watch. And the other side of it is the perhaps slightly more negative thing that I alluded to that um, Green, Hugh Green didn't seem to like other people telling him what to do. Um, I'm not sure he liked being managed by anybody. And so he very much liked doing his own thing, um, even against explicit orders from his superiors. Um, so he was very much his own man in that sense. Um, but he also then, you know, uh, he, he walked the walk as well as talking the talk. Mm. He um, let his own staff do their own thing. He did not believe in micromanaging in that sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, now, here's an interesting question from David Field. How did listeners assess the truth in broadcasts before the term fake news was invented? That's a very interesting question. Um, yes, I mean, we, we tend to think that we've invented fake news. Uh, fake news has been with us ever since the media have been with us and possibly before that. Um, well, how did listeners assess whether a report was truthful or not? Is the answer in relation to the BBC German service is really a long-term one. And that was Hugh Green's strategy that if you, reported truthfully on British military setbacks, um, which were very frequent at the beginning of the war, of course, things like um, Dunkirk, uh, the fall of Singapore, all these terrible, terrible British setbacks. If the BBC German service reported truthfully that this had happened, 
then the gamble was that they would also be believed once they started reporting on British military victories, if and when the tide of war started to turn, and that the Germans listening would say, oh, well, you know, they, they admitted to things not going so well for them at the start of the war, and now it seems uh, we are losing. Um, so we, we have no reason not to believe them. That, that was the long-term gamble, that if, if you told the truth at the beginning of the war, you might be believed later on. Uh, and the, the even bigger gamble was, of course, that Britain would eventually be successful in the war um, and would have British military victories to report. Um, but of course, if you were a listener within Nazi Germany, you had very little access to any kind of objective uh, sources, and you really didn't have any way of, of assessing this by yourself. You had to figure out for yourself which media source you would trust, and probably if you weren't a fan of the Nazis, then something that had been actively banned by the Nazis would be something you would trust. So that's another reason that people would believe the BBC German service. Mm, thank you. Now here's a, another interesting question from, from Mari. How was the fact that there was a BBC German service perceived by the British people, given that nowadays there is often a backlash by certain groups that taxpayers' money should not be spent abroad? Yes, so um, I don't think it's ever been popular that taxpayers' money should be spent abroad, um, but so initially, that very first broadcast I mentioned of, of uh, Chamberlain's speech, which was a disaster on many fronts, one of the fronts on which it was a disaster was that um, the BBC had to use some of its existing frequencies, which uh, were frequencies that people listened to within the UK. Um, and so some people, when they heard German being broadcast on these frequencies, thought that there'd been some sort of German invasion or something, that it was deeply unsettling to the few people who did actually manage to get this broadcast. Um, so that was, was a bit of an unmitigated disaster. Um, then the question of taxpayers' money, um, the BBC's foreign services are the one bit of the BBC that has never been funded by the license fee. They from the start were funded by the Foreign Office. Um, and that in itself entails quite an interesting relationship with government um, in that although the BBC has most of the time managed to be at arm's length from the government, the foreign services weren't quite so much at arm's length. They were funded by the Foreign Office and um, were therefore expected to, to be the voice of Britain and to pursue British interests abroad. Um, so it was not so much uh, having to justify the BBC German service to the taxpayer, it was more um, having to negotiate that relationship between the BBC German service and the Foreign Office at different points uh, in its existence. And that gets quite tangled up during the Cold War as well. Just to pick up on that one, um... Isn't it true that quite a lot of the German service during the Cold War um, uh, was staffed by people who were actually uh, MI6 um, uh, people? So there was a strong sort of connection between um, yeah, secret services, um, the Foreign Office, the BBC. It was sort of all part of the same, the same set in a way. Yes, well, the problem with uh, MI6 agents is that they don't tell you that they're MI6 agents, even once they're retired. Um, I, believe me, I have tried to get people <laughs> to, to let me in on this. Um, probably, yes. Uh, as I say, there are, certainly during the Cold War, there are some interesting connections. Um, if anyone uh, watched the program that was on, on German TV last night, which is about uh, a, yes. a program put out for East Germany called letters without signatures, where the German service would read out um, letters they'd received from anonymous correspondents in East Germany. Um, and one thing we do know is that these letters, which are often today prized as, you know, giving East Germans a voice and, and um, giving them a, a, a kind of lifeline to the outside world, we know that these uh, letters were regularly passed on from the BBC to the Foreign Office, a department within the Foreign Office, and from there to the 
uh, British embassy in Bonn, which was also full of spies. Um, so yes, that's one example of these entanglements between the BBC German service and various different arms of, of the government, mm. Um, mm. which yeah was not always an easy relationship. Well, was this one of the reasons why the BBC kept the German service going for so long? I mean, it was only done away with in the 1990s, if I'm correct. Yes, the German service finally closed in 1999. Um, but during the 90s, it was massively scaled back. Um, mm. So there were increasing cuts. And then in 99, it finally closed. Well, um, the BBC's, the, the German service's raison d'etre after the Second World War was really uh, the fight against communism. Mm. That was the, the card that the German service could always play when it came to um, you know, a new budget and the foreign office demanding cuts to different foreign services. The German service could always say, oh, but we broadcast to East Germany and that is important. Um, and it claimed that it had to also maintain a West German service in parallel uh, to uh, uphold the pretense that it wasn't just broadcasting to East Germany, um, so that East Germans would somehow have more faith in it. Um, so that's how it very much managed to survive, uh, even under some uh, swinging cuts by, I think, the Thatcher government. Um, that was uh, one of the later um, things that happened to many services. They felt, I think the French service fell prey to the Thatcher government eventually. So lots and lots of the European services had to close, but the German service could always say, oh, we're broadcasting to East Germany. And that's mm -hmm. important, just as mm -hmm. the other Eastern European services were kept up. Mm -hmm. um, but once the wall came down, that was, of course, the death knell, in a sense, mm -hmm. for the BBC mm -hmm. German service, because suddenly all of Germany technically had access to um, mm -hmm. a huge range of free media. Mm -hmm. I remember listening to the BBC German service in the late 1990s, just after the capital had moved back to Berlin. And whoever it was said in full earnestness, he was, he was talking about some conference and he said, in Bonn, a small town on the Rhine, such and such a conference opened last night. So you know, the government had been in Bonn until what, about a month earlier or something else. Anyway, any other questions or comments from the audience? Do speak up or put something in the chat. Um, I find it interesting that um, you um, fell foul of political interference himself when he became director general of the BBC and the fact that he hadn't been able to protect um, Dr. Grimmer from political interference. I, I don't know if it would have been possible to have found some alternative governance for the um, Nordwestdeutsche Rundfunk, but certainly when he became director general, he fell foul of um, Harold Wilson and Lord Hill and um, felt, felt in, impelled to resign. Uh, yes, so uh, I mean, there's, there's two things in that. Yes, uh, Hugh Green as director general himself did, as you say, um, struggle with political interference. That was that was one of the markers of his tenure. Um, he'd been a great innovator. He um, enabled staff to put on quite controversial programs, um, but then um, politics sort of clamped down on that a bit. Um, and on the German side of things, yes, perhaps one of his not so successful um, acts at the NVDR was appointing Adolf Wimmer, who turned out to be quite easily swayed by different um, political parties, uh, by pressure in many different ways. And so when Wimmer was left to his own devices, once Hugh Green departed, um, NVDR did become a bit more embroiled with politics uh, one way and another. So yes, that's, that's very true. Hmm. Thank you. Any, any other? Um, yes. Um, at the exhibition, Very British, two years ago in Bonn, letters were displayed from school children to the BBC 
Do you, do you know anything about that? No, I don't. I'm very interested in that. I would love to hear more about that. Um, this is Ursula Roth, who is, who is asking, why, why, did you, why did you say a word or two if you turn your microphone on? Right. No, we still can't hear. Try again. No, no. Yeah. Good evening. Yes, Hello. these were, uh, I didn't uh, mention it. These were school children from the GDR. And one of those was traced. There were people going to the school and asking all in the class to write a letter. And then they compared the writing and they found out the one who had written to the BBC. And of course, he uh, was punished for it. Mm -hmm. yes, was before the yeah. fall of, of the war. And, and I found yeah. it uh, uh, so, so yeah. yes, emotionally touching to see that letter the young boy had written. But there were many other, other letters. Mm. But uh, he complained that he had to lead a life in the GDR, no? which was so uh, yeah. Yeah. secluded. That story came up in the in that TV production last night, actually. Ah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh, mm. um, but I'm I'm interested in that that there were more letters from school children. So these were yes. all from the GDR. Interesting. Yes, all from the GDR. Okay. At least these were the ones were displayed yeah. in this exhibition. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. That's very yes. interesting. I will look yes. into that. Of course, the the BBC Written Archive Centre in uh, Reading. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. holds um, a huge archive of thousands and thousands of letters from East Germany, mainly, mm -hmm. um, which, which came to the, mm -hmm. the BBC German service over that time. Uh, it was 25 years that they ran that programme, Letters Without Signatures, and all the original yes, letters. Yes, Letters Without Signatures. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I can't see any mm -hmm. other... Oh, wait a minute, there's some remark here. Mm -hmm. Um, unfair question, Nick Trefkert says, but I'll ask it anyway. What do you expect as the end game to the conflict between UK government and the BBC, the present UK government and the BBC? Oh, that's a, that is an unfair question. Um, that's a very tricky one to answer. Um, well, sorry, Emily, sorry. No, no, that's that's absolutely... It's, it's, no, it's, it's a valid question. It's a very, very pertinent question at the moment. I am deeply worried for the BBC's future because with the latest arrangement for the first time, um, the Foreign Office will no longer fund the um, foreign services, which mm. means that all of that money would have to come out of the licence fee. And at the same time, um, there is huge pressure to get rid of the license fee or massively reduce the license fee and uh, et cetera. So, well, I, I can't give you any exact prediction as to what the end game will be, but I think current developments are deeply concerning because the BBC Foreign Services really are the way in which Britain presents itself to the world. Um, I think the BBC has such a high standing internationally. Um, you know, you can go to the deepest, darkest corner of the globe. And um, when you hear someone interviewed there, they say, oh, BBC, yeah, I've heard of that. You know, I, I trust the BBC, I know the BBC. Um, that I think it has such a high standing that it would be such a pity to gamble that away, to throw that away. And I think we are in real danger of doing that right now. So mm. the, the development, particularly around the foreign services, does concern me. Yeah. yeah. Um, maybe the maybe the foreign services should be taken over by the NDR. Maybe, yes, a German takeover. <laughs> Perhaps it's mm. time for that. Mm. Mm. I'm not quite sure whether that would be a good idea. Um, May I ask not, a question? Entirely, not entirely serious, Rupert, don't uh, worry. There, there's, one, there's one question here in the chat um, about that um, program last night. It was on ARD Alpha, um, and I'm not quite sure what it was called because I was a bit late in tuning in, so it, I didn't see the uh, title. It was called um, London Calling, Peter ah. Austin Kaisen Creek. Yeah. 
and you can probably find it on the Mediatek now. Yes, yeah, yeah. I'm, sure, I'm sure you can, yes. I wanted to ask um, a question. Uh, yes, let's yeah. have it. Yeah. Um, yeah, good evening, Berlin. This is Heidelberg speaking. <laughs> okay, I was I was wondering, you, you mentioned, of course, we all know that some people in Germany were able to listen to the BBC um, during the war. And I have always been, and you see it in, in movies and you know it, you know, that people were managing. How did they manage? And uh, I mean, it's just that I'm technically, you know, I'm not um, capable. And also, how did um, the how was it found out? I mean, some people were punished and um, they were detected. And but um, yeah, I just, you know, want a bit about that. More of the technical details. Yes. So, yeah. Um, the BBC, um, anyone with a decent radio set could technically um, listen to the BBC German service. So it transmitted mainly on medium wave, but also on short wave. Um, it had lots of different frequencies that it would use. Um, of course, the further you got from the UK, the harder it was to get decent reception. So reception would have been much better throughout the war in Northwest Germany than say Austria. So that was one difference. Um, at the same time, the Nazis tried to jam broadcasts, as I mentioned, oh. so they tried to broadcast interference noise. So you would have to try and listen quite carefully. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, an advantage from the British point of view was, of course, that the Nazis had churned out lots and lots of cheap Volksempfänger. So lots of people had radios and were capable of receiving um, these things. So uh, yes, and you had to be quite careful as a listener. Um, lots of people from that time remember listening underneath the bedclothes to muffle the sound, right? Um, things like that. And some people were indeed detected, and um, there were there were fines, there were prison sentences, um, there were death sentences, but I don't think any of them were actually carried out um, in the end. Right. But um, there there could be serious serious consequences for anyone who was found out. Hmm. Okay. Last question uh, from somebody it just says IMA or I M M A. Um, please yes. turn your mic on and, and, and put yes. your question. Um, I have a question. The MDR is currently very strong on scientific podcasts. Is there any um, tradition to that or is that something just coincidental? Um, that's a good question. I, I mean, I, I get the impression there's always been an interest in the science side of things uh, in terms of wanting to offer listeners a, a broad spectrum of um, different programs. And um, I mean, the, the example that springs to mind at the moment is um, the things like uh, Zendung mit der Maus, trying to, to get um, science uh, for children. And, and I think uh, various parts of the NDR have always been very good at that kind of thing. So I think there's always been a a strong interest in science and some of the early programming was certainly about technology and, and science and those things so I, I think there is some tradition of it but I, recently with podcasting it, it seems to have uh, got an additional boost. Thank you. Thank, thank you that sort of brings us to the end of this um, this event. Emily thank you very much indeed for, for doing this it's been uh, really interesting listening to you, although I heard you um, only a few weeks ago, there was a lot of new things there too. Um, and thank you all for listening in. Um, and um, please forgive me for sort of uh, um, pointing out the family ties at the beginning. Um, but I will, will say a special goodbye to all kinds of members of my family who've been listening in, but also to you. And see you again, I hope, um, for our next event. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much.